Let's talk about the Kingdom of Mauritania, an ancient realm nestled in what we now know as Morocco and Algeria, not to be confused with the modern-day country of Mauritania. The name Mauritania actually comes from the Maori or Moors, a Berber tribe who called this place home. Back in the day, Mauritania was buzzing with productivity. They were known for growing grains, olives, and even producing a sought-after dye called Tyrian purple along their coasts. It was a happening spot. When the Romans rolled in, they split Mauritania into two parts, Mauritania Tingitana and Mauritania Caesarensis. These areas became big suppliers of food for the Roman Empire until the Vandals crashed the party in the 5th century. Now, rewind way back. The early days of Mauritania saw various groups settling in. First up were the Capsian culture folks, who were into hunting and gathering, but eventually got into farming around 7000 BC. Then came the Proto-Berbers, who spread across North Africa and the Sahara, with the Maori taking center stage in Mauritania. The Maori were an interesting bunch, organized into clans and ruled by chieftains. Some were nomadic, herding animals and crafting goods, while others settled down and got into farming, especially along the coast. Eventually, these clans united under a monarchy, and Mauritania became a force to be reckoned with by the 3rd century BCE, giving even Numidia a run for its money and Mauritania had quite the strategic location. It was like the crossroads between the Mediterranean and the Sahara. This meant they were rubbing shoulders with everyone, especially the Phoenicians. The Maori traded all sorts of goodies with them, from ivory to precious stones, and even animal hides. The Phoenicians had set up shop in places like Tengiz, modern-day Tangier, and Lixis along Mauritania's coast. And get this! Some Maori and Numidians even tagged along with the Carthaginians as mercenaries or allies. Now, looking towards the south, the Maori were getting their hands on ostrich eggs, amber, and even gold from folks living deep in the Sahara. But despite all this trading hustle, Mauritania didn't urbanize as quickly as its neighbor Numidia, probably because of its smaller population. When Carthage took a hit after the Second Punic War, Mauritania swooped in and snagged many of their old ports, including Tingis. Some folks think this contact with the Phoenicians might have kickstarted Mauritania's journey towards becoming a more city-centric state, but hey, the history books don't give us too many details about this time. Fast forward a bit, and we're mingling with the Romans now. Bacchus I, a big shot back then, was tight with King Jugurtha of Numidia during the Jugurthine Wars, but then he pulled a sneaky move and handed Jugurtha over to the Romans. As a thank you, Rome handed him the western chunk of Numidia after Jugurtha's downfall. After Bacchus I's time was up, his kingdom split in two, with different kings ruling over different parts. Some of these Mauritanian kings were cozying up with the Romans, even sending troops to fight in their armies. But not everyone was on good terms with Rome, some of the western kings had beef with them. Bacchus II and Bogut were the first Mauritanian kings to mint coins. They were even playing the political game, siding with different Roman factions during their civil wars. After a bit of back and forth, Bacchus II ended up snagging Bogid to's territory, uniting Mauritania under his rule. But here's the twist. When Bacchus II kicked the bucket, he left his kingdom to Rome. Augustus, the Roman bigwig, settled some of his army's veterans in Mauritania but wasn't too keen on the whole organizing and protecting bit. And now let's talk about the reign of Juba II and the Roman annexation. So, after some Roman love, Augustus decided to reward a Numidian prince named Juba II by making him the king of Mauritania. Juba II was all about modernizing Mauritania. He jazzed up cities like Volubilis and Eo, giving them a Greco-Roman makeover with fancy temples, palaces, and amphitheaters. Eo even got a name change to Caesarea in honor of Augustus. But Juba II wasn't just into architecture. He also married Cleopatra Selene, a princess from Egypt, which brought some Egyptian vibes to Mauritania's art and architecture. Juba II and his son, King Ptolemy, were big on farming and pushed policies to boost agriculture, especially along the coast. But being Roman pals didn't save them from internal and external troubles. They had to deal with pesky uprisings from folks living in the mountains and skirmishes with tribes from the Sahara like the Gaetuli and Morugini who kept raiding Mauritania and other Roman territories. Things took a turn in 40 CE, when Emperor Caligula decided he wasn't feeling Ptolemy and had him executed. Mauritania got annexed by Rome again, this time becoming a full-blown Roman province. Now, it was split into two, 
Mauritania Caesarensis in the east with Caesarea as its capital, and Mauritania Tingitana in the west with Valiabilis as its capital. These provinces were under the direct thumb of the emperor, not the Roman Senate, and were ruled by equestrian procurators. But life wasn't all smooth sailing for the Romans. Rebellions kept popping up in the interior, and Roman troops had a tough time dealing with the rugged terrain and crafty Mauritanian warriors. Eventually, they struck a deal with the interior tribes, letting them keep their chieftains in exchange for some peace and quiet. During this time, Mauritania saw a blend of Berber and Roman cultures, a process called Romanization. Latin became the language of choice, and many Mauritanians rose to prominence in the Roman Empire as politicians, scholars, and soldiers. Roman infrastructure like aqueducts sprouted up, and agriculture shifted towards Mediterranean styles, with olives becoming a hit crop. Mauritania even got into the fish paste game, churning out garum for the Romans to devour. Trade boomed, with ships bustling in and out of port cities along the coast, ferrying goods to feed the empire's hunger. To protect this trade, the Roman navy kept a watchful eye for pirates, while inland, a network of roads and forts regulated the movement of people and goods. Despite the Roman influence, the pastoral tribes of Mauritania kept on with their seasonal migrations, now paying tariffs to Roman officials along the way. And now let's talk about what went down in late antiquity. So, as we rolled into the 3rd century, trouble started brewing again in Mauritania. Tribes were revolting left and right, and the Bequates even managed to break free under their own king. New tribes were popping up all over the place, sparking more conflicts in the provinces. The Romans started lumping any Northeast African tribes living outside their borders as Moors or Maori. In a bid to keep their weakening empire intact, Emperor Diocletian decided to shake things up. The Roman Empire pulled out of most of Mauritania Tingitana, holding on to just a tiny slice of land around Tingis, which was now under the rule of the Diocese of Spain. They also carved out a new province, Mauritania Cytofensis, from Mauritania Caesarensis. These provinces fell under the Diocese of Africa, which also included Numidia and Africa Proconsularis. With the Roman Empire shrinking, Mauritania saw the rise of Moorish kings, who, despite their fancy Roman and Greek titles, were pretty much running the show independently. Meanwhile, Christianity was spreading like wildfire across Roman-controlled North Africa. By the second century, it had folks converting left and right, whether they were city slickers or country bumpkins. People were ditching the old polytheistic worship, and you could see it in the decline of dedications to African and Greco-Roman deities. But while Christianity was on the rise, urban centers were taking a hit. Infrastructure was falling apart, and the wealth was drying up. Emperor Diocletian tried to breathe some life back into the cities by fixing up old temples and such, but not everyone was sold on the idea. Out in the countryside, though, Christianity was thriving. Churches started popping up like mushrooms, and soon, they were everywhere you looked. And, the Church of Africa wasn't all sunshine and rainbows. A big old rift appeared in the 4th century thanks to the Donatists. You see, during Emperor Diocletian's crackdown on Christianity, some folks caved and renounced their faith, while others stuck to their guns and ended up martyred. After the dust settled, those who renounced Christianity waltzed back into their roles, causing a stir, especially when Sicilian was elected as Bishop of Africa. Enter Majorinus and his successor, Donatus. The they were like, nah, Sicilian ain't our bishop, and split from the church, founding the Donatist sect. These guys weren't keen on rebaptism or letting lapsed Christians back into the clergy. Now, Donatism spread like wildfire across Mauritania, drawing in mostly lower-class folks but with some literate middle-class clergy on board too. The powers that be weren't too thrilled about this and declared Donatism a heresy. Emperor Constantine I wasn't playing games either. He booted Donatist clergy and took over their churches. But did that stop them? Nope. By 330 CE, there were hundreds of Donatist bishops kicking around North Africa. Things got even messier with the rise of the Circumcellians, a group of religious fanatics tied to the Donatist movement. These guys weren't just about theology, they had gripes with the social order, like the power of the rich and slavery. Some were so gung-ho for martyrdom that they picked fights just to get themselves killed. Violence erupted between these fanatics and others on both sides of the Donatist controversy. Emperor Constantius II doubled down on the crackdown, but it wasn't until Julian the Apostate came along and eased up on the exiles that the Donatists got a breather. They even lent a hand to rebels like Firmus and Gildo, who tried to stick it to the Roman Empire. 
But when those rebellions flopped, the Donatists took a hit. Catholic Bishop Augustine of Hippo wasn't a fan either, he spent his days slamming Donatism and pushing for legal action against them. Things came to a head in 412 CE at a big conference where bishops from both sides duked it out. After that, Emperor Honorius put the final nail in the coffin, banning Donatism and giving their clergy an ultimatum, ditch the sect or hit the road. Donatism hung on for a while, but it never regained its former glory, especially once Islam started making waves in Mauritania. And now let's talk about the Vandal and Islamic rule in Mauritania. As the Western Roman Empire struggled to keep things together, local elites across its provinces saw a chance to grab power for themselves. While the Berber tribes had been a thorn in Rome's side for a while, the real threat to Mauritania came from an unexpected direction, Northern Europe. In the late 4th century, a bunch of Germanic tribes, famously known as the Vandals, started causing a ruckus. They crossed the Rhine, stormed through Gaul, and set up shop in southern Spain by the 420s. With control over ports in Iberia, they soon had a grip on maritime trade and began eyeing up Mauritania. Under King Gunderic, the Vandals hit Mauritania's coast like a storm, looting cities left and right. But it was King Gezeric who really shook things up. In 429 CE, he led a massive invasion of North Africa with around 80,000 Vandals. They blitzed through Mauritania, then moved east to conquer Numidia and Africa Proconsularis. The Romans couldn't kick them out, so they ended up signing a treaty with the Vandals in 442 CE, basically saying, okay, you can stay, but don't cause too much trouble. Meanwhile, Mauritania still technically belonged to Rome, but that didn't stop the Vandals from gradually gobbling up chunks of eastern Mauritania. Gezeric was quite the diplomat too. He buddied up with the Moorish kingdoms in Mauritania's interior and western edges, getting them to join his raids on places like Italy, even Rome itself. But after Gezeric kicked the bucket, these Moors started eyeing the Vandals' turf. In 534 CE, the Byzantine Emperor Justinian I sent his general Belisarius to retake North Africa. They briefly recaptured Mauritania's side offenses, but it didn't last long. Soon enough, most of Mauritania fell back under Moorish control. These Moorish kingdoms were Christian and kept the Latin names and titles of their Roman predecessors. They even built these fancy tombs called Jetters, showing off a bit of cultural continuity with earlier Berber kingdoms. These small kingdoms held sway until the rise of Islamic Moorish empires in the High Middle Ages, but that's a tale for another time.